Lock it, fill it, curl it, find it, view it, code it, jump and lock it, surf it, scroll it, pose it, pick it, cross it, crack it, twitch, and fade it. So, I will get started by asking Christian to kind of share with us his story where you, um, you successfully used uh, Android in your small business. Back in 2009, uh, early 2009, late 2008, um, as we all know, our economy pretty much imploded. Uh, I had a successful wholesale business um, selling uh, dry ice uh, to medical labs, which I still do. But uh, I saw my uh, my very nice salary just go away. Being newly married, having a, a little one on the way, uh, and my wife recently got laid off when she was five months pregnant. Uh, anybody that's a parent on this on this panel can pretty much understand. Me. I was in full freak out mode. So I took the last of our savings and I bought a, a ten year old truck. Then the Nexus One comes out, and uh, so I purchased the Nexus One and uh, started playing around with it. And the more I played with Android, the more it allowed me to discover all the other uh, Google properties. And that started a process in my brain of thinking how I can integrate these properties that Google, uh, and specifically to Android, on how to grow my business. I discovered Google Apps and uh, how to be able to create a, a, a bigger presence or project a bigger presence uh, to clients by having your own domain. Things are really easy to use. Well, once you get started down Google, the Google Apps route and you start uh, Putting, adding people into that organization, then you discover, um, you know, latitude. You discover the power of uh, maps. You discover, uh, uh, you know, other apps that are out there available that can help you grow a small business. Six years ago, we were paying thousands of dollars uh, just to do what we're able to do now, you know, the system. And, and the same thing goes in logistics for what Google Maps and Latitude have done in my business is circumvent, you know, pretty much about $5,000 of equipment per truck. Just the simple fact that you can arm uh, a, a driver, a team member, with a $60, $70 Android device, and from that device, they can uh, provide proof of delivery, they can be tracked, they can receive information real time, and uh, as long as they're connected, the customer is connected on the other end. So in the past three years, uh, we have grown from uh, to half a million dollars in sales uh, on this company, all with no debt, bootstrap, all the way. That was one of my self-imposed conditions after what happened in 2009, I swore off debt. So if I couldn't do it uh, with cash and I couldn't cash flow it, I wouldn't do it. Uh, we could grow bigger, faster, but that would uh, that would that would indicate financing, outside financing, and that's something I'm not willing to do. Okay. Today we are, uh, as far as technology, fully integrated into Android, fully committed to the Google the Google uh, the Google properties. I'm starting to uh, install the cloud printers in every in every uh, in every truck. That way, uh, the drivers have access to. Um, uh, to paper in case they need it. Mm -hmm. you know. But what, what apps have really been um, kind of game changers or that you found that maybe even like third party apps that aren't Google made um, that were really okay. helpful? Third party apps, uh, any barcode scanner. We're creating our own QR codes to track deliveries. Mm -hmm. Another one is Cam Card Scanner or Cam Document Scanner. Uh, that, that's what we use to scan documents uh, and get it back to in real time to, uh, to customers. Smarter, uh, which is a contact relational database manager. It gives it, uh, the drivers and the team members a good snapshot of who they're dealing with. So not only the person that you are, are interacting with via email or, or a phone call, but also how they are related to everybody else within your organization and within outside organizations. Along those lines, do you have a, a kind of a wish list or a, any kind of specific areas that an app would be helpful that there isn't anything yet? Largo is a back-end provider of logistics, uh, logistics software. 
Okay. But the problem with their software is that it's integral. It's, it's not a standalone product. You have to buy the back end, you know, their back end uh, uh, software suite to be able to access this. My vision would be to have a standalone app with maybe a, uh, a cloud back end for, you know, detailed reporting and, and things of that nature. Instead of having to access five or six different apps, um, you know, just integrate into this one app and have different modules within the app. So along those lines, then we'll kind of switch things over to Andrew. Uh, Andrew May, if you guys don't know him, um, he is a Android app developer here in Knoxville. Andrew, uh, what I wanted to ask you about is, is let's talk about creating an app. What is the app creation process like? The process itself is actually very long and drawn out. Uh, if you're a smaller developer, you can be a little more agile and create things quickly. Little is development time for a very you know large project with very agile team. You're talking three months. But that's the shortest turnaround you're going to talk, and they're working 24/7. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that goes into these apps that people just don't like, just aren't aware. The prices can get somewhat outrageous. For a very simple app, you're talking about five thousand dollars, and it just keeps going up from there. Right. A good developer is going to cost you eighty-five dollars an hour minimum. When did you start getting into Android programming? Yeah, I was a .NET developer for Anderson News, a local company in Knoxville that went under around 2008-2009. The company itself started going under. I had some foreknowledge on that, so I started up my own consulting company. My first consulting gig was, a again, another mobile device, and it just kept snowballing from there. I got some other contracts, and it led to iOS development, uh, and iOS le uh, led to Android development. Android just, I prefer it, I like it, I like the openness of Android. Uh, that said, every platform has its pros and cons. So let's say I want to get into Android app. What, what, what should I learn first? What languages? What do I need to buy? The nice thing if you're going into Android is you can start anywhere. Uh, in the aspect of hardware-wise, you can develop using a MacBook, a, a PC, anything, you can Ubuntu, uh, OS 10, Windows, it doesn't matter. You can use any IDE development you want to use. They prefer, Google prefers you to use Eclipse and supports Eclipse, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're limited to that. You have a wide variety of hardware devices to test on, plus the emulators. Uh, now, most developers will complain that emulators are horrible and slow, and I will confirm that, <laughs> but it still gives you a groundwork in some place to start. And you also have different options. You know, you've got AppCelerator and all of those sorts of things. As a developer, I generally do not recommend them. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be some issues, and you never know when iOS might decide, hey, you, know, you built something once for an accelerator to work both on Android and iOS, and hey, when is mobile uh, phone 7? You never know when their terms are going to change, and they're going to rip that out. Yep. When you develop natively, they're not going to toss you out. Well, the last thing that I wanted to talk to both you guys about, because you both keep up with Google products and just the app marketplace in general. At what point does does that list become unmanageable, or does it? Is it just can it grow forever? It depends on how you curate the market. What I mean, there's a lot of junk that goes in mm -hmm. any market there is. I think Google's doing a great job of curating the market there. There's a lot of app overload. Uh, but that said, uh, specifically in the Android market, there's a lot of holes to be, be filled. It's because it really is hard to develop for Android in certain aspects, and that's due to fragmentation. I don't hear a lot of developers using one code base to write for both phone and tablets, and that's a big mistake. Yeah. And they're making it hard on themselves, they're making development harder, uh, and so therefore these great apps are just not showing up on here. And part of it, uh, at least one of my theories, is Java. You're not really tapping a great market there. iOS had, of course, Objective-C, and they had that market with OS X already Objective-C that the people are knew the language, so you had a great market to tap into. Christian, what, what do you think about, I mean, you probably go to the app marketplace pretty often. How cluttered is it to you, and does that help or hurt your, your search for new things? You're always going to have uh, discovery issues once, once, the, uh, once the market hits a certain threshold of apps. Google is getting really good with uh, with the um, you know 
the, the, being able to filter out certain, you know, certain apps. Uh, as far as um, searching itself within the market, they have a long way to go. But uh, as far as discovery, uh, you know, of course, you know, the really popular good apps, you know, those tend to, uh, to, to rise to the top and yeah. easy to discover. You just have to read a lot, you know, and have to be on top of the technology, uh, you know, blogs and, and the news. To kind of discover those those apps and 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 to be honest with you, most of the useful apps that I, that I use every day or that I use within my business have been discovered that way. How do you promote an app in a marketplace this big? If you're building for consumers, how do you get that out into the marketplace and actually make people pay attention to it? I can answer from my perspective as yeah. a developer. Generally, I'm not worried about that. I'm well, right. <laughs> to write some code. Right. Have you seen anything that does or doesn't work? Have you? I mean, you've probably seen what your clients have done after you've built an app, you know, you kept up with it a little. Has there been anything that stood out as bad or good? The only thing bad I've ever seen a client do <laughs> is get a minimal viable product out and then stop paying me to maintain it and not, having any, and not hiring anyone else to maintain it. I will have to agree with Andrew in that sense that uh, the worst thing that you can do is abandon the app. If you're going to abandon the app, might as well take it off the market. You say you might not as well as ever paid for it. Exactly. Or, or, or releasing an app before the core functionality is fleshed out. Downloading an app for the first time from the market is like going on your first date. You know, that first impression of the app, that is the only time you're going to get somebody that's not into technology, that is just looking for a solution. That's the only chance you're going to get to make an impression. If you show up to your date, you know, without having a bath for a week, forget it. You're not going on another date. It's the same thing with apps. You know, if, if your app doesn't do what you, um, what you, you, your description says it's going to do, then why should I give you another chance? I mean, who had any questions for either of these guys relating to Android apps and, and or, or maybe has their own input? for some of the questions I asked them. Yeah, I, I kind of dropped into it. I mean, I, I wanted to develop for smartphones, uh, looked at available options. Android is really the only option if you just want to uh, drop into it. You're, you're right. Uh, you're restricted with iOS. You have to have a MacBook. You have to have an iOS device. Uh, yeah. it, it's a high cost. Uh, yeah. The cost to develop for iOS. That said, there's a big payoffs if you do it. If you like Objective-C, I mean, that's also a big if. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. Most people, it's hard, hard for them to wrap their heads around, and they get yeah. really frustrated. I've got so, a question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, again, just because I'm an Android developer, and I love talking about Android. <laughs> uh, are you using fragments in your current uh, uh, programming? Uh, are you using that at all, or have you not yet? Not yet. I urge you to look at it because the backwards compatibility allows you to build something, and it's a very good pack, backwards compatibility package. Mm -hmm. uh, by using the fragments, you're now enabling yourself to build something for the tablets as well as phones. If you set this up correctly and kind of use an activity to shoehorn either into a fragment or, uh, or, or into a fragment with multiple fragments, um, the ability to, to maintain your code efficiently rather than having a code base for tablets and then a code base for your phones, which I find many, many large uh, developers are doing as well. Many, many issues with the uh, user interface because of the differing re resolutions. It's the only major issue I've found that you need different layouts for, uh, for tablets with the largest mm -hmm. screen. You, of course, use your resources folder there and use your different layouts uh, folders mm -hmm. to to structure that, and what you do, and what uh, Google doesn't do a good job of evangelizing is that you need to think about it as a web layout. When you're looking at your screens and designing your screens, think about it like a web page. And the reason being is the fragmentation between screen sizes. Mm -hmm. One thing I do want to warn, and I see a lot of developers doing this, is, and again, I keep saying it, and it's, it's because you can't maintain your application if you have multiple APKs. And recently, Google allowed this. I shouldn't say recently. I think it was at the last I.O. They announced it, and I think they followed through quickly, allowing you to target multiple APKs to certain devices, or rather one APK to multiple devices, so you can handle saying, OK, this device only runs this APK. This device only runs this APK. 
Okay. The problem with that is, of course, you're, you're maintaining multiple versions of your code. Yeah. We're getting very into a heavy technical conversation that I think is no, I, I, I think is less relevant to most people here. I, I know you guys could probably do this forever, but does anyone else have any um, more general questions? I have a question for uh, all the devs in the house. Um, I want to do it. Um, I'm so young too. Um, I can still go to school. Um, what do you recommend I do if I want to, um, you know, start? development not as a developer but as a business owner i can tell you that you're essentially going to own you're going to be self-employed so the best advice that i can give you to avoid financial commitments don't get into debt don't be afraid to fail try 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 you learn more from your failures than your success mm -hmm. and this is a critical time for you uh, to, to choose the path and direction that you want to go in. I think what I'm trying to get at is what do I learn? Okay, let me, if you're talking like you have, you're gonna go either back to college or start fresh from college, let me give you pointers. They don't teach you much in the business world. So what Christian was saying right there, very, very important. And the debt thing is incredibly important. Pick up books like uh, The Pragmatic Programmer, uh, Code Complete, because the concept behind object-oriented programming is key. Syntax is, is just syntax. Uh, and hey, you can be a lazy programmer sometimes. I'm all bit Sometimes I don't remember the syntax everywhere. But hey, guess what? Between IntelliSense and Eclipse, you know, Eclipse having it, uh, Visual Studio having it, if I completely forget, I can look it up. And then, hey, that's what Google's for there, too. But if you understand the basic concepts of object-oriented programming, you're set up. Now, if you want to go, you know, start fresh for school, uh, they'll gloss over those things and kind of teach you some languages, uh, and they won't prepare you for the real life. And they kind of leave you hanging. So Android is a real good one to start uh, start programming mobile applications with. Uh, pick up a Java book, any, you know, go to Amazon, find what has the best reviews for, for analysis. Uh, pick that up, but then also pick up, like my recommendations, the uh, Pragmatic Programmer, the uh, code complete, uh, things like that, because they'll give you better insights into programming that those books themselves won't teach you. Yeah. And, and I think another thing is that, that most people forget these days in uh, traditional school is that there's always the, the apprenticeship. I will find a developer in your area and just start getting, just start doing things around, you, around for them if they let you hang out. Most of the things that I learned for business, I didn't learn at school. One, one thing to kind of add, um, if you don't already visit one, I would suggest uh, checking out a local user group. It's kind of good to, uh, you know, just socialize, kind of like a Google Hangout, but, you know, in, in person and kind of just talk with other developers. That's one good way to find, find maybe a mentor. Another thing is if you're, if you're looking to take formal classes and kind of get that core, um, core kind of information out of the way, um, just go to like iTunes and check out iTunes U. So you got like Stanford classes and MIT classes on programming and just kind of like the core concepts. And that's a way that you can um, kind of walk through some of the example projects in those classes without having to put down money for a, like an official degree. Yeah. I think that, that could be a whole other topic on, you know, I mean, computer programming, it changes so much and the degrees don't teach you, I mean, you guys can probably speak to this more than me, but the degrees don't teach you what you need to know to actually do it on your own, develop on your own. I would agree. I keep up with some friends uh, out west who decided to continue their education and it's, it's just it's actually useless what they're learning. So, you know, for, for somebody that wants to learn programming, let's say you start learning and you, you get on your own and you're, you're doing pretty good, you've got a good background, you make your first little app just to try it, you know, something like that. Um, how, where's your certification? At what point can you go to a company and say, I'm qualified for this job? I started my own company. Right. right. I, uh, I've done a lot of uh, projects. If you look at my website, the personal website, I've got my resume there. Yeah. And I've, like, well, big list of projects I worked on, uh, examples to show, and yeah, that's basically what I've got to show yeah. some certification. Yeah. That is one excellent way. Ultimately, every single company has different 
different methods of what they consider you know, certification for you know, app development. Uh, there's nothing really set in stone out there other than just having experience. You guys have any final um, final words? Yeah, Andrew, we need to we need to link up uh, to see if we can develop something or make a ton of money doing it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like fun. I'm into. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we we got new connections made all over the place. Andrew, you got any final words? Anyone who wants to talk to me, I'm always open. Email me, talk to me anytime you want. Uh, if you want my Skype information, drop me a line and I'll, I'll send you my Skype so you can always buzz me anytime you want.